some of you have uh, been wanting me to do a Q&A on the channel for quite some time. Over the years, there's been a lot of questions that have been sent to me, and I've tried to be, you know, consistent with uh, answering you guys back either through the comments on the videos or the, you know, I get a lot of emails from you guys and just trying to get back with, you know, every question that has been posed to me or questions that have been forwarded to me to forward to some of my guests. A lot of y'all have sent me questions uh, for Pedge, uh, quite a few of you, and I've answered a couple of those prior but I've just been collecting your questions, so I don't want y'all to think that they haven't gone unanswered. I figured I would go ahead and try out a Q&A for the channel. Obviously, this first one is done in my traditional format, but if this uh, works out well in the future, I may do, do these live maybe once a month or every couple of months. So it's going to be kind of like a trial and error. But... Um, I figured that there is no one better to do uh, the first Q&A with than Pedge. So I brought him on with me as a guest because I've received the most questions from you guys for Pedge. So I figured it was best to have him join me to answer some of your questions directly. So I have Pedge with, with me. Today. How you doing, man? It's good. Just uh, bearing this cold that we got here. A little cold snap in Florida and throughout the country. <laughs> no doubt it is freezing down here for sure it got down <laughs> yeah, to the, the upper really 20s cool. you know so. yeah it's, it's crazy the nighttime is you know you know i had to pull out my new york blankets that i still kept from new york like it's just uh it's crazy it's insane but i mean i mean you know i'm here like seven years so it's like i know we have a little cold snaps here and there it doesn't last long right yeah, no, it won't. It'll be like on and off like next weekend. It's going to yeah. be back up in the 80s. And then, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll get another cold front. That's kind of, yeah, of course. you know, a lot of people come down here and catch pneumonia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, jump into this. I do have quite a few questions for you. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and it's uh, there's definitely no doubt that uh, you've been one of my most polarizing guests on the channel as, uh, as far as the feedback, you know, people definitely seem to enjoy our segments together. And I've gotten quite a bit of, uh, not, you know, just positive feedback, but also questions for you. So I've just kind of right. collected these to, uh, to do this Q and a with. Well, so. let me say, I really, really do appreciate the, uh, subscribers and those that listen that they really, uh, they find it, you know, intriguing or they just like my, uh, my stories or whatever it is, the, the, you know, the camaraderie between the both of us, you know, I really, I really appreciate it. I want to say thank you to everybody. And a lot of guys reached out to me in the comments section and I really, I really appreciate you guys. And, um, I hope, I hope this segment will start something new for Mike. Um, you know, maybe down the line, he could, uh, interview some other guys and do some question and answers with them as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I would uh, enjoy doing it. You know, uh, I know you've been actually asking me to do this for quite some time as well. Yeah. And uh, I've had a few of the subscribers are like, man, do a QA, and a do a Q&A. Um, yeah, correct. So I thought, yeah, man, why not? You know, yeah. so um, the first question is from Vinny T. He wanted, okay. this was a question for you. He said, um, do you ever go back to Ridgewood and what are the biggest changes from when you were on the street there? Okay. Um, yeah, I do go back from time to time. You know, my dad's back there. And um, uh, other than that, I, you know, my girlfriend's family's there. I go to see them as well. Uh, but uh, the changes are dramatic. I mean, uh, between the regentrification of the neighborhood, you know, where I grew up, it was Bushwick, um, Brooklyn and, and Ridgewood and, you know, Glendale, there's a lot of new, I mean, new faces. Um, it's like the Fresh Pond Road area where the Giannini crew was and all the Italians, and you know, the Yugoslavians and whatever. It's now taking a whole turn. It's like Polish, Albanian and a lot of Russians. It's just, 
you know, it's kind of mind boggling, you know, just to go back after two or three years and to see, you know, this, this, this big change. It's just, of course I run in, you know, to the occasional friend or guy that I grew up with from the neighborhood or, you know, I mean, I still got, you know, uh, you know, roots in the community, you know, so the community is still there. Yes, there's new faces, but, um, um, a lot of people have moved uh, out and left, but there's still, you know, still a, a good, you know, root system of people. Um, the street, man, that's a different thing. Um, where you used to see gangsters, you know, you know, parading up and down the street, and you could tell who's a wise guy or who's an associate and this and that. You don't see them as often unless you go to specific spots, which is cafes, uh, social clubs, so on and so forth. Some of them have closed up, like Bobby Glass's place is, it went, went into a, a Yugo bar, from a Yugo bar to an Albanian bar. None of them, you know, prospered. Now it's like a, you know, cell phone store or a vape store or something. But last trip, I showed you some pictures that I drove by. I drove by the old Casablanca. It's a different game today, you know. It's not, it's not what it was. A lot of people have moved on to Long Island. Right, right. It is what it is. It's changed. You know, the face of the mob has completely changed. It's more secretive now, you know. So Yeah, it is it is interesting. It has gone back to, you know, definitely that for sure. So Stevie Boy, uh Mr. Oh, Fugazi Boy. from uh over in England. That's right, over the pond. Over the pond. He has already oh, asked me, but he also asks you as well, Pedge. So okay. I guess I'll I'll answer it first, and then uh, yeah, and you then you can give your opinion. But um, he asks, in your opinion, what or who was the most respected boss and underboss ever in New York? So pertaining okay. to the five families, um, okay. my my answer to that would be. Uh, on the boss side would be Lucky Luciano, in my opinion. I mean, only because the street gang that he came out of, you know, basically spawned all the forefathers of uh, the American Mafia. You know, a lot of the Jew kids were in that, Meyer Lansky, Bugs right. and Siegel. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is Al Capone was also in that crew. Right. He originally came from New York. Um, right. So... Uh, you know, but but with that being said, obviously, Charles Luciano uh, formed the American Mafia for what it became, uh, giving it structure with the commission. Uh, so I would definitely say him as far as uh, just innovating. So that's my answer for the boss. As far as underboss uh, would be Fat Tony Salerno. Right. Uh, and mainly because he operated so efficiently that a lot of people thought he was actually the boss, the boss. Of, of the Genovese family, when in fact he was basically uh, a beard boss, a face, um, you know, or a street boss. So um, those are my answers. Uh, who are yours, Pedge? I'm going to agree with you on Lucky Luciano, but I'm going to spin this off a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, with the original syndicate, I'm going to call it the syndicate, uh, it was, you know, it was Polish, Jews, Russian Jews, German Jews, you know, a lot of Jews, like a lot of Jews, a lot of Irish, they were, they were mixed into that, you know, and when Lucky Luciano came in, yes, you know, he had the greatest ideas of having to answer to like five different heads and, you know, do the commission and all of that. Uh, I think that's where the, he killed the syndicate and he made it a predominantly Italian thing. Um, you know, and Mayor Lansky came in and, you know, all these other guys came in and, you know, and, you know, Siegel was a part of it. Siegel was sent out, but it's just, um, he, um, he changed the face and made it completely Italian, which irked a lot of, a lot of the people, Dutch Schultz especially. And that's why they, you know, whacked him. And, but, um, uh, I think yes, Lucky Luciano was the the uh, what, what, what do you call that the cornerstone of 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 the mafia itself, La Cosa Nostra. Mm. But as in a boss, Carlo Gambino, oh, I yeah. think he was the one who masterminded it past Lucky Luciano's ideas and everything that was going great. And I think I think Carlo Gambino. 
Um, you know, as for underboss, I agree with you on Tony Solano. He, he, you know, people didn't know if he was the boss or the underboss. You know, it was just he was the face for the longest time. Um, but he was, uh, you know, and he was ruthless. I, I know that for a fact. I met, I met a few, uh, a few of his family members when I was living in Brooklyn, and, uh, right before he got pinched. And he was, he was that cigar chomping, you know. All right. <laughs> He looked like a bulldog, man. Yeah, no yeah, doubt. For real, for real. And he had that old school, uh, that old school style about him, you know. But he, he was the underboss, you know. I mean, right. in my eyes, so and there won't be another boss like Carlo Gambino ever, ever, you know. So. Well, and, and again, he was asking just New York. Now, obviously, if we were going outside the confines of New York, I would definitely right. say, you know, have to place Santo Traficani Jr. up there, but. He was specifically saying New York. So those were my answers. Yeah. And I think right. you and I are pretty much along the same page. Um, so the next question is from, this is from SD Serb. They ask you, Pedge, uh, yes. how was Bosco able to become the boss of the Westies without being Irish? Okay, very simple. Um, during the seventies, when Bosco did what he did by bombing all these uh, Yugoslavian communist social clubs, and you know there was a murder he was involved in, or whatever. Um, you know he was, you know he started as a parking lot attendant, you know, but he was always hustling and doing what he was doing. He mixed up with Kunin, and you know, and it was. You know, his networking of guys in Hell's Kitchen at that time, a lot of Serbian immigrants coming in. And uh, that was the area. Our church is in that area, you know, a few blocks off of Hell's Kitchen. And um, so him becoming the member was easy. You know, Kunin, Kunin actually gave, gave him the heads up. He was like, he was always a good earner. I mean, super good earner. Had the connections with, with you know, all these Yaks, Yugoslavian, Albanian, Croatian, Serbs. Uh, predominantly he was Serbian, but um, between the Irish, there was a couple of non-Irish. I think there was a guy, uh, Mike the Greek. Um, you know, there was a, a Croatian guy involved as well. Uh, it, it was just a huge influx of different people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a statistic that. You know, right when Coonan got sentenced and Featherstone was ratting and Bosco got the nod to take over, it was a good, you know, 100, 150 plus members. And out of those was a good 75 to 80 percent Serbian. So that, there's the answer right there. You know, if you've got 75 to 80 Serbians running around, and some whatever Croatians and you know Albanians running around with you. Well, who you think they're going to follow? They're going to follow another Irish guy who's got no experience, or they're going to follow a guy who was Kunin's right hand man, and you know worked directly with Kunin, and you know Kunin gave the nod, you know, and it is what it is. So he just slipped a right in, you know, and he was very good with the Italians as well. So there goes your plus, you know. So he was very good with the Gambinos. He was good with the Genovese. You know? Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you another Serb yes. question. This is from Mirjana Dordovic. I wonder if I said that right. It could be right. Dordovic. It could be Dor Dorjevic. I'm, you know. She has a couple questions, but I'll ask you. Okay. I'll ask you one now. We'll come back to her second okay. question. Definitely. Um, she says, uh, I was a baby when the Kosovo War was happening. How was Radovan Karadzic's relationship with our then Serbian president Slobodan Milosevic? Very, very tight. Um, they were very organized. He'd come to Belgrade. Milosevic would go up in that direction, but towards the actual full frontal war and all of that, Milosevic tried to, you know, pull himself away. He would, I mean, he would supply, you know, Radovan with, you know former Yugoslavian National Army, you know, tanks and whatnot, like, because once they were pulling out of Bosnia, the actual Yugoslav National Army, they were leaving stuff behind for the, uh, 
Bosnian Serbs. Uh, of course, Bosco was involved in that too. He was uh, funding, you know, through illegal operations. He was, you know, funding weapons, uh, you know, uh, medicines, bullets, whatever, whatever the whatever he could do to help the cause. He was he was a main a main fixture in that. But uh, Slobodan and, and Radovan were very tight. Um, you could all, you could you could almost say. I mean, I don't have inside information, but you could almost say uh, that Slobodan was calling the shots, Radovan was following, and then Radovan started doing his own. And uh, the main goal was to keep Bosnia within the Yugoslavian Federation, which the Muslims did not want anything to do with, and. It is what it is. I mean, you know, the rest is history. Um, so that I guess that's the answer to that. They were very tight. Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask you the second question since we're on the topic. She asks, uh, do you think Kosovo will ever officially be back to Serbia? Um, as, as any good patriot, you know, I'm going to say yes. Uh, will it be... You know, and in its entirety, border to border, you know, uh, village to village, no. Um, the situation right now is a powder keg, it's a Pandora's box. It's it's a total shit show what's going on right now. Uh, there were so many pogroms against the Serbs, you know, they signed Resolution 1244, UN Resolution to, you know, let the K4 come in and, and help out and protect the enclaves and they have done, done nothing. It's just Serbian ghettos. The only surviving structure of any Serbs left, if they haven't been pushed out, forced out, um, you know, uh, ethnically cleansed, is uh, northern Kosovo, which is uh, Kosovska Mitrovica. So that right now looks like the only chunk we will get. But um, I really feel bad if the UN doesn't uh, agree to their 12... 4-4 resolution and allow Serbian troops back in because that was part of the deal. Uh, if, you know, Ulix, K4, NATO cannot help the Serbs, which they're not, they're following the Albanians, which they first labeled as terrorists, and after that, they labeled them as freedom fighters. So, as history also shows, um, you know, it's... You know, we've lost Kosovo, we gained it. We lost it, we gained it. We lost it, we gained it. Okay, so we lost it for, what, 20 years now, 22 years. We're going to get it back. Um, and it's entirely, I don't think so. But wherever there's a Serbian grave, wherever there's a Serbian monastery from the 7th century, you could move in all the people you want. And, you know, they could multiply and whatever. You know, that's like Texas saying, hey, you know, uh, we're going to go back to the, you know, Mexican Union. That ain't happening. I don't care if you got 90% Mexicans living there. Texas is Texas. Kosovo is Kosovo. So, you know, um, I'm iffy. I don't like to see war again. But uh, Serbian military is preparing very hard. The U.S. has been training the Albanians and supplying them with weapons. Um, and, you know, this political thing, you know, me and you talk politics all the time. So, you know, you know, the EU is pushing, oh, you need to give in and give in, and they're pushing Serbia to give in. Uh, you're trying to give them the money. You can be in the EU. You can this, you can that. I don't think Serbia wants to be part of the EU. I just think they want what's theirs, and Kosovo does belong to them. It's a sovereign piece of their country. And under that UN Resolution 1244, that's the way it stays. So we shall see what happens, but, you know, I know a piece of it will definitely break off and tensions will rise. Right. So that's my answer to that one. I hope it was in-depth. Well, if she uh, wants to expand on that and sends me yeah. a follow-up, I'll let you know. Sure, sure. Um, so James Francis asks me if I currently have any more TV projects coming up. Um, uh, as far as the TV stuff, there's nothing I can, that I can talk about right now pertaining to that, uh, film projects. Yeah. I'm working on a couple or have worked on a couple things recently. Uh, there is a film coming out 
called The Haunting of Julia Fields. It's by Maz Appeal Productions, who I've worked with on quite a few projects. That will be coming. I think they sold it for streaming, so we'll probably be on either Netflix or Amazon Prime. I'm not sure yet, but that's a feature film. Um, yeah, so there, that is coming. Uh, as far as the TV stuff, I, I can't really talk about that right now. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, and let's see. It's kind of sucks you have to tiptoe through that stuff. But, you know, work is work. I mean, you know, you got to keep projects under wraps. Right. Well, because especially when things are uh, discussed, Moving. nothing's in, in yeah. concrete. Uh, you know, and that's not just on my end. That's where people are like, hey, this is potentially happening. We don't want it to be talked about. And every uh, production company and every network does things differently. Um, right. So Adrian Martinez asks, what does the mob do today to bring in money? So this is for you, Pedge. Okay. Well, um, from my insights and from the people that I talk to, the mob is still doing drugs. They're doing a lot of the white collar crimes, like, you know, um, stock trading, cyber, um, you know, credit cards they're still doing. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the basic, what, what can, what can you do? You know, you know, you can't, I mean, loan sharking is still doing, they're still doing gambling, but it's, it's like, it's like a real joke today because, you know, you got cameras everywhere. The ATM across the street can record you, you know, they could turn somebody's cell phone on if they wanted to, uh, besides the street cameras at every corner. I mean, it's you, you, you can't do anything without getting away with it. Like, you know, 25, 30 years ago, it's a different ball of wax. I mean, you know, you could carjack somebody and then it's just, their word versus yours. Today, it's like, oh, well, you were there. They got, they could like superimpose the tattoo on your hand and be like, match it up. So, um, and with, with gambling and loan sharking, I mean, all you, all you need to do as a civilian is just go and go to the police and say, oh, this guy's strong arming me or you know so that that just gets thrown right out the door and there was a case just now in long island where a bunch of uh, bananas and gambinos got caught for doing just that they not even what 12 or 14 months they were on their investigation they were like doing the joker poker machines out of all the bodegas and then you know that's gambling there and uh, they were doing loan sharking so if anybody needs money five ten grand they hit you up with like exorbitant three four points and people don't want to pay. Like, why am I going to pay you? You're not going to break my legs. You're not going to come and threaten my family. And unless the mob's going to get back into the dirty, you know, nitty gritty of what the mob was. And they're going to go and like kidnap somebody or, you know, send that message across not to talk. Civilians are going to talk. I mean, and the mob always had this thing about civilians, not to hurt civilians in a certain way, which is an oxymoron in itself because don't hurt civilians, don't get them involved in our business, but yet you go and you hit civilians and you extort them and you, you know, protection rackets and all of that shit. So it really doesn't make any sense in my eyes, but, you know, um, to have that rule like civilians are civilians, you know. But I think the mainstay for them is drugs um, and legitimate businesses. As many legitimate businesses you can get into so that you could, you know, funnel funnel dirty money and clean it, you know, and then you yeah, pay absolutely. taxes too. Plus the government's happy. They leave you be, but, um, that's the majority of things. And I mean, like what I remember before I left every mobster, I knew restaurants, car dealerships, you know, used car dealerships, uh, laundromats, uh, pizzerias. It's, it's cash business. It's, you know, you come in and out. It's like, you know, nobody's going to ask you, would you get 30 grand to buy these cars? Because you don't buy 10, 15 cars at once at the auction. You go in there and you, you get one car and you put it on your lot. And next month you get another one. You, you trickle in, you know. So, you know, I'm sorry that I'm giving away secrets here. But I'm not giving away any fucking secrets that, you know, that's like before I left, they were doing it. And it was like full force they were doing it. They're doing it down here in Florida now. All these, all these guys that either... Uh, ratted or didn't rat or just left a life. First thing they're fucking doing is they're doing that. They're 
They're opening up, uh, you know, car detailing businesses. It's a cash business. It's like you get five, six Mexicans to work for you. They bust their ass. You pay them a decent wage with lunch. And then uh, you're taking in three, four hundred dollars a car. You know, you, you get 10, 15 cars a day. Do your math. You know, you got the steady money coming in. Well, right. then again, there's no kick up to the boss because they're down here. They're left that life. They're just trying to expand for themselves. You know? Yeah, and there's no active crime family down here anymore. There's a lot of guys coming into Tampa. A lot of guys coming into Tampa now. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, it is what it is. I mean, like, I've ran into a few guys, a lot of guys from Philly. A lot of guys from Philly are here, Jersey, from upstate, from Buffalo, from Rochester. A lot of guys down here. Right. Chris Breeder has asked me a couple of times on... Uh, comments on my videos why i don't show my face on the channel much actually i don't hardly any um so why as you know most of my uploads are audio interviews uh that are focused on the subject so you know obviously all the images that i'm going to be showing on those interviews are of these gentlemen uh you know period photos of when they were operating on the street and some modern photos if they provide me with those I, I guess a quick short answer would be that my channel has never been about me it's predominantly a history channel so it's about the history that I cover you know I'm not a vain person I'm not gonna put a spotlight on myself when I'm trying to cover a subject that is external you know in the future I start doing video interviews obviously you'll see my face you know I'll throw a photo up uh, during this segment that I'm answering you so you can see my face. If I can interject, I really, I really wish you would do. I mean, you've got years and years of audio and it's great. It's a great platform. You're like, you could say you're, uh, everybody could say you're the originator of this and the mob genre, you know, one of the most by far best channels out there. Um, I think you should do a video not because of vanity or anything like that, but to actually see you, you know, um, you know, talk to the other guest or the person you're interviewing to see the, you know, the, the in between actions, like the facial gestures, the right? Whole thing. The interaction. I think it would be just more entertaining, and you know, you could always go back to the audio thing, but I think I think that's what you should do, and like, just give it a try and see if it if, if it. If it works, and see if your subs, uh, if your subs like it. If your subs like it, you give the subs what they want. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with that. Um, you know, obviously, as you pointed out, I started this thing literally like seven, eight years ago. Uh, so back then, technology wasn't caught up to where it is now. So it's like I kind of started it as a radio format, and um, you know, being that I my channel was predominantly interviews and uh, back then as you pointed out i was the first channel on youtube to produce mafia interviews so since that was my primary thing it was primarily audio um but now that you know it's like technology has far surpassed where i started at then it's like it's kind of like i'm still kind of caught in my comfort zone of where i started yeah. at you know, I yeah. agree, I agree with you. You know, obviously, when I have people asking me these questions, that's, I guess, what they want. You know, yeah, I get that. Yeah. I, I totally get that. I mean, it's almost like the same thing with uh, why I don't hound people for money on here. It's like it's like I don't need YouTube for money. I make right. I make plenty of money outside of YouTube to not need a few right. shekels on YouTube. So I don't hound it's anybody for money. Yeah, it's like it's just a platform for me to house my research, my history work. And look, this has made me money. It's branched out to uh, network TV sure. projects. And uh, and obviously, I have a Patreon set up. You know, it's there. If people want to donate, they can. I'm not going to ever ask them to, but it's there okay. if, they, if they want to. You know, there's a lot of channels that will do these lives. They'll go on every day. They'll be on for eight hours at a pop. I mean, literally, these people live on YouTube. They, I think they leave YouTube on when they even go to bed at night and sleep. 
it's still going. <laughs> I'm not knocking that, you know, more power to them. But I have a livelihood outside of the internet, you know, so, um, but that's that, you know, I'll, I'll never hound anyone, so. Well, Mike, I hope you do try to do some other genres too, like you did in the past with the, the war stuff and history and some, you know, like conspiracy things, you know. I think you should branch out a little bit more and, um, you know, get a broader base of, of audience because there's a lot of interesting topics out there. And I know me and you both have talked on the side beyond, you know, besides this program, we've talked about, you know, some pretty cool stuff. And, you know, we, we sat on the phone for like two, three hours talking about this stuff. Like there's, right. there's you know, some, some well, really, I am, really I, hot topics. I am going to be doing a lot more, um, World War II history. I'm going to just say military history uh, yeah. because it'll kind of, you know, there'll be different other things right. that I want to cover too, but predominantly World War II. Uh, and, and I've started doing a few uploads uh, um, through the years covering, you know, uh, equipment or, um, you know, like an army tank or, or right. a, a howitzer cannon or, or whatever. I'm going to start doing a, a few more. I, I, I started that series. It's called Relics of War. So um, as I do those, I'm just going to kind of split my library up. So people who are interested in the organized crime material, they can go into my library and there'll be a list for just that. And the people who are interested in the military history can go into the list and just pull that up, you know. So I am going to start doing a lot more of that because uh, I've been researching organized crime for literally 17 years now. Uh, actually, wow. a little longer, maybe uh, actually closer to 19 years. Um, wow. I mean, only on YouTube for, you know, seven or eight. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I am going to branch out more for sure. Cool. Cool. Let's see here. I have a couple more questions. Um, one is a question we've kind of already answered uh, uh, with Adrian, but Stevie Boy asks, what is the biggest earner for the New York mob? He lists loan sharking, gambling, or garbage collection. I, I actually don't think it's probably any of those three anymore. Yeah, me neither. Uh, garbage for sure has been like, uh, I mean, in Jersey, <laughs> it's still a little bit mob, you know, they got their influence, you know, but, uh, in New York, I know personally, like back in, uh, early nineties, it was only three or four major companies. They were mob owned, you know, um. Uh, I forgot who it was. Carlo Gambino's brother got got hit in the dark in the government district. That was his section. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Lucchese the the had like, a contract too. Yeah, they just squeezed and they kind of got the mob out. The last last guy that I remember that was mob was TNT Garbage Hauling and uh, Filiberto. And uh, Filiberto just sold out. You know, his dad was in the mob and all of that, but yeah, he was dumb. He just, you know, he, 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 to kick up money constantly, and to, you know, overprice the bids and have guys going freaking strong on people. You know, that, that you could have did that back then. Yeah, but today, you know, I mean, look, like, like I said, the civilians today just go to the cops and they don't give a shit because they know the mob's not going to do nothing. I think more of it is drugs. Drugs are the way, the way he's like. It's just, you know, you know, the cartels are doing their thing and the cartels are bringing it in. But uh, as like in the 90s, you know, when Bosco was sending his guys to South America, they were making the connections. And uh, the narco trade is the biggest trade there is right now. Just right. I agree with that. I, I would say dr I big. would say drugs and insurance scams still are probably yeah. pretty big, you know, for. Yeah, I mean, income. anything to do like, like I said, cyber. You know, fake, making these fake accounts, you know, send here, send there. And then, you know, you, your company folds in three months and you just open up another one. And, right. Uh, you know, that's that's always easy money and, you know, these illegal gambling dens or they're investing in legal gambling and just setting up shop. And I mean, like, I, I'm not in that game anymore, so I don't know. But 
I mean, from what I hear from people, drugs, for sure, opening up weed dispensaries. Right, and then that's money. legalized. And again, that's even an yeah. uh, that that's even an avenue to be able to launder money through and of, still make money legitimately oh. through it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, real quick with the garbage uh, collection to answer Stevie Boy on that, you know, uh, under Giuliani, they ended up making uh, an actual oversight uh, committee uh, where they start looking at these contracts, Companies. you know, yeah. uh, that that are going out uh, where basically organized crime could put their claws into this stuff. So really, there's a lot of oversight on that now. Yep. And and these large corporate companies like Waste Management and all of those come in, the mob can't compete with those. So they're, they've they pretty much taken all of the urban contracts, the large city yep. contracts and all of that. And it's really like, like Pedge stated a while ago, it's pushed the mob out to more small rural contracts where the pickups are few and far between where waste management's not even going to want to deal with that because the overhead is higher than what they'll make off of running trucks in those areas. So I would definitely say uh, the little bit of garbage collection that's left for the mafia is just small contract stuff, and they're probably utilizing those more for uh, laundering operations than anything. So Now, uh, we do have a couple more questions. Um, I have one from... Uh, Racy Shea, who was actually my former drummer, he asked if I composed the underscore to the Hollow Earth documentary that is currently streaming. Uh, yes, I did. That is right. streaming on 2B TV, uh, possibly Hulu. I don't know if it's streaming on Hulu, but it's definitely on 2B TV, maybe on Amazon it, uh, Prime. Uh, one more question for you, Pedge. Sure. Actually, this is from our buddy, Mark Terragrosa. My, my man. Yeah, I know. Mark's great. Uh, he says, Pedge, do you remember when I robbed the Jamaican and I did it and I, and I didn't tell you, I ran yeah. to your car and said, go, go, go. You asked what I did after I was in your car and they shot at us. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, uh, you just mentioning that just like put me in the driver's seat. It, it's um, uh, the story goes. Uh, I was at the coffee shop on uh, on Manahan in Cyprus. Uh, Mark was at his girlfriend's house. Uh, he beat me, or I, I forgot he called the shop and he hey, his pet there because he needed a ride home. It was a good like a three four mile drive, you know. Mm. So um, you know, I was like. I come get you, you know. I was I was gonna head home anyway, so I went to get him, and like a block and a half up, there was these Jamaicans in the in a corner. I don't know if it was a six family or three family with a walk in basement. The basement was just like three steps down, and that's what they were selling beef. Uh, I, I thought Mark was gonna go cop a bag of weed because he's like smoke weed, you know. That's his that's his thing. So oh, shit, man. Fidaddling, whatever, lighting up a cigarette, double park, you know? And, um, actually, I wasn't double parked. I was kind of like Lamborghini park, meaning, like, I was, like, four feet from the curb. It was, like, a Johnny pump or something. And, uh, I just remember Mark, like, I heard a scuffle, and I just see Mark running with his garbage bag. <laughs> and he's just like, go, 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 go. And I'm like, go fucking where? Where do you want me to fucking go? And he's just like, would you fucking go? And I see this Jamaican guy come out. You know, bumba clap, whatever he was saying. And I'm like, I hit, you know, I go to hit the gas. This kid already just grabs the, the, the shifter knob because it was around the steering wheel back then. And you didn't have to put your foot on the brake like with these, you know, new cars, that you know, to shift it. It was just, he shifted it and I'm stepping on the gas. Then I, then like, he's literally like on the floor, like pressing the gas pedal even more with his hand. And I'm going, I'm like screeching out or whatever. And, uh. You know, I'm like, what the fuck did you do? And all of a sudden, he goes, you just robbed them. And then you hear, pop, 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 pop. So I just, like, pulled out my gun. I just, like, popped out two out the fucking window, turned the fucking corner. And I'm like, are you fucking nuts? Are you fucking cut? You don't even give, give me a warning? You know? And he's like, shut up. 
goes in the bag, pulls out, I don't know how many dime bags of, of weed, gives it to me, and it was like, lots of money, throws a lot of money at me. He goes, shut up, yeah, here you go, I'll take care of you, I'll take care of everybody, you know that. And I was just like, yo, but you're insane, bro. You don't tell me, you don't prepare me. He goes, but if I would have told you, would you try to talk me out of it? And I'm like, dude, you could have just got one bag. He's like, fuck those Jamaicans, you know? That that was Mark, man. Mark was just priceless, man. You know, like, a little, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I got tons of stories, but I know Mark's writing a book, and I don't want to, like, you know, fuck his, uh, his entrance into this, into this book, because I know he's got tons of stories in that book. Yes, know? absolutely. You know, he's still working on it. We, we, we still talk, and we, like, you know, have a remembrance. Like, he'll remind me of a certain situation. I'm like, oh, yeah, and I give him the details. And he's like, that's right, I forgot. And So I, I want his book to be a success. And, you know, I'm still, I started mine, never finished it. But uh, I'm waiting for Mark to finish his, and then um, I'll do mine, and then um uh, well, and I, and I think that's the cool thing. Uh, you know, one thing that Mark, um, and I need to get with you actually, you know, um, off of, yeah. off the phone, but there was something that, uh, for a story, he wanted to get your quote on to, for us to sure. put into the book, sure. you know, more of like secondhand insight of somebody well, who was I, there. He started out with, with, with us Yugoslavian kids, you know, Serbian, Romanians and everybody in the neighborhood. But, he branched out quick to the Italians, to this, to that. Wherever they, he can make money. Uh, you know, we we dropped cars together. We did a lot of things together. Uh, stereos, you know, a uh, couple heists here and there. Like, and, I, and I'm going to be honest with you. Like, the first couple of years, it was, you know, Mark was in my crew uh, or Mark had a little crew. We, we were always together, you know. And, you know, you forget things. Because time passes and you like to stick to yourself in one little genre area of your life. And when I reconnected with Mark through your show, it was just, my God, like uh, my early teenage life, you know. It's just, yeah, that, and that's what I was going to say. You know, a lot of these, you know, like you guys and a lot of these other guys that talk, it's just a small portion of y'all's life. I mean, it's just a small portion of when all of y'all were young kids, young men. It, you know, and, and it's a shame that people get defined by that, you know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Some guys want to be defined by that. I don't know why uh, that lifestyle, but it's like it's only a small portion. You know, some guys were only on the street for a couple of years, really, you know, but um, yeah. but it is what it is. You know, I mean, obviously, yeah. like you said, uh, you know, I know a lot of your story and a lot of Mark's story. Right. And I think it's very cool that you guys uh, came out of it on the other end and y'all can kind of reminisce yeah. back now, you know, so very yeah, we've cool. We've been doing a lot of that, and I'm, and I'm going to be honest with you, we've been doing a lot of that. And uh, one thing Mark said, uh, I don't know, about a week ago, um, he was just like, you know, Pedge, you know, did you ever think you were going to make it out? I was like, no. I really didn't. I didn't think I was going to make it out. I thought I was going to get clipped. I thought uh, something something was going to happen to me. Just something bad. I was going to be in jail for a long time. And, you know, I beat I beat that clock a few times. I mean, I've, I've been arrested and whatnot. I've expunged my record. Um, you know, I'm not in that life anymore. I'm going to be 54 next month. It's 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 a dead game. You know, you can hustle some other way. Something a little bit more. You know. Uh, legal and you know put your put your efforts into something else you know so i'm working on that with a few guys that you know have some money and they want to invest and they want my expertise in the business and so you know i may start doing some other stuff but you know talking to mark he's he he, he made a comment that you know when we walk down the street or we walk in somewhere it's always you know your backs to the wall you know and you're always counting what everybody's doing and, you know, counseling, like, you know, well, this guy's having a lot of beers. He's going to look like a troublemaker, you know, the eggs here, the eggs is there. I got six bottles of beer on my table. You know, we're always, it's it, that, that life does not leave you. You know, you're always looking over your shoulder. And he said, you know, people always look at me and they're scared shitless of me because I have this, this presence on my face and this swagger about me. I said, you know what? That street embedded that in us. Like, I can't right. take it for the life of me, you know? 
Yeah, just the way you carry yourselves. That's not that's ingrained into you, you know. Um, that's legit, man. Like I've always said in every interview, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, you know, the right people, if they want to make an effort, they'll reach out to me. Everybody else can stay the fuck away from me. I really don't care. And you know my life. I do a lot of reading. Uh, anything that's interesting to me, I do. I stay home, go to the gym as best I can, as old as I'm getting. And you've seen my pictures. I'm still in shape, still working out. I got my good days and bad days. But, you know, my main thing is, you know, to, to, to be a dad or to just maybe do some something else. I mean, like, you know, if I was smart enough to do all that hustling with all those years, I got to be able to do something with shit. I mean, I've had businesses before. I just don't have the bankroll right now. So if one of my friends that has a bankroll wants to go into a, you know, a proposition with me and to do something, you know, I'm always open. You know what I'm saying? I'm always open. I'm not a, not a stranger to hard work. Right. Absolutely. All right, Pedge. Well, shit, man. I enjoyed this, actually. It was, oh, it was yeah, fun. It, it flowed really good. And like I said, you know, I mean, this is, uh, this is legit. I mean, I, I mean, since you and I have done a handful of, uh, segments, uh, they've right. all gotten great feedback and every time, man, I get a lot of, uh, questions, whether through the comments or, right. you know, uh, through email and you definitely are somebody that, uh, you know, my subs have been very interested in, and I hope that we are able to, that. you know, answer some I of really their questions. Appreciate that. At least. I want to thank them again. I really want to thank them again. Um, this is not something that I wanted to do. I was asked by a former associate to do the interview. I did the first one, and people took a liking to me, and I really want to be humble and thankful for that. Right. I'm not in this mob genre. I don't, you know, go on other shows and yeah, absolutely. stay away from it. You know, I saw um, we've done the Serbian history thing, you know, uh, like I said, I don't do this for notoriety, but I'm just giving you my insight. You know, uh, I was in that life. You know, I have to tread water. I have to, you know, tiptoe through this you know, mob pond and watch what I say, because, you know, uh, I could easily, you know, stick my foot in my mouth and get hit with a charge. And I just don't want that. I mean. I'm lucky to be alive. I'm lucky to be literally told by mobsters to leave. Um, uh, you know, enough respect to give me that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to bury anybody or shit talk anybody. Right. And, um, that's about it. So I hope, like I said, I hope the sub loved this interview or liked the interview at least. I hope I answered the best I could. And hopefully we'll do another show uh, on another topic. Absolutely, man. Well, you know, you and I talk all the time. We'll come up with something. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> all right, my man. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you coming on, Pedge. All right. Thank you so much. All right, buddy.